Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode number four of the Multi-Cloud Expedition. I'm your host, Alexander Romero, Senior Director of VMware Cross-Cloud Services, and we've got a super exciting show today, which is live. So for those that are joining us live right now, feel free to ask any questions inside the, uh, the comments. So on our multi-cloud expedition, we go ahead and tackle the toughest challenges for organizations as they're dealing with the multi-cloud and having a multi-cloud IT architecture. Before we jump into the show today, let's level set on what we define as the multi-cloud. So with that, I've got a, a visual aid. And what we've found, so we talked to our customers and our customers have told us that 87% of them are now using two or more clouds today. And the way we define that is everything from way over on the left, on-prem, right, to private cloud, to hybrid cloud, to the hyperscalers, all the way out through the edge. So uh, over the last several years, clouds, of course, have become more and more uh, utilized. And now enterprises, organizations, governments are using uh, two or more clouds, 87% of them. So that began a journey for customers into what started as cloud first, right? Where they were looking at time to value to try to get applications up and running as quickly as possible. Let's do it in the cloud. Let's do it fast, right? However, pretty quickly that turned into a dip and that dip went down and put them into many of them into a cloud chaos, which is many different cloud properties, lots of different operating processes, and as a result, actually slowing down application development and time to value. So this series is all about, we can jump to the next slide, helping right to utilize VMware's cross-cloud services in order to get customers to cloud smart and faster time to value of capabilities that will help them either deliver uh, increased revenue, right, or save money or improve their security posture. So with that, if you missed one of the uh, last three episodes, this is episode number four, here's a quick recap. We kicked off the series by starting with episode number one, and this was really about increasing developer velocity, going back to that concept of time to value, right? So time to value, how do we get developers up and running in the cloud as quickly as possible with consistent guidelines? So great episode, highly encourage folks to go back and, and take a look at that. Next, we move into, in a multi-cloud environment, let's start with the basics, the fundamentals of cost, the fundamentals of observability, and a little bit of security. So diving into how do we look at cost in different clouds, right? How do we tag those? How do we report on them? As well as observability of applications in clouds. So another great episode, both of them featuring product demonstrations as well as subject matter experts. Continuing in that trend, we went to episode number three. Now we went deeper into advanced strategies for governance and security, not just setting policies, but making sure those policies don't drift, right? Once they're set, how do you govern that? How do you make sure it's part of your operating procedures? And then went all the way into the complexity of application security when application components are broken up and operating in different clouds, uh, covering everything from traffic that goes between them to being able to uh, make sure east-west, even between clouds, is properly is properly secured. So three great episodes. Highly encourage you. They're all available on demand. So please take a, take a look at those. Okay, what are we going to cover on today's episode? Uh, today, uh, we'll, we'll be number one, talking, bringing a guest speaker in a second, who's going an industry expert. And that's going to recap some of the points they've seen from those prior episodes. Then that's a perfect transition to going from uh, that recap into uh, network security, right? So we're going to cover network security. We're going to look at visibility. How do we turn the lights on for secure for network security? Then how do we uh, limit a blast radius in the, in that networked world? After that, we'll look at anomalous behavior. And then should the worst happen, ransomware uh, hit. How do we recover from that? So we've got a full show, great uh, speakers, great guest speakers, great subject matter experts. Um, I encourage you again, if you've got quite, if you see questions along the way or you have questions that come up of things we're talking about, 
go ahead and put those questions in the comments because we'll bring back the subject matter experts at the end to dive into that Q&A. So I hope you stick around for the whole show. All right. Now, before we dive into, into uh, uh, the, uh, the later speakers, let's please welcome a uh, fabulous guest, uh, Kevin Jackson, an industry expert, and he's coming to us all the way from Cairo. So thank you very much for taking time out of your uh, busy schedule in order to join us here. No, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm um, I here in Cairo at the uh, Future of Data Center conference. And I tell you, it's all about clouds out here. The country is looking towards cloud to uh, innovate its uh, industry and, 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 it, and it's, that's what they want to do. Yeah. Well, before we, uh, uh, that's awesome. Tell us a little bit, give us a little bit of your background since this is the first time you're joining us on the, uh, the show. Well, great. Yes. Um, so I was in the military for a while and I uh, uh, flew on and off aircraft carriers, enjoyed that and uh, worked on the uh, maybe space technology program and uh, the shuttle and, and some low earth orbit systems. And that's when I actually got look, uh, worked in global communications uh, for these systems and uh, eventually started working with companies with service oriented architectures and leveraging those technologies for new business models. And that's how I got into cloud computing. I worked with the uh, US government intelligence community as they built uh, their hybrid cloud, you know, one of the early multi-cloud customers. Um, and then I started consulting with uh, commercial organizations and uh, governments uh, and, and um, started helping them develop their governance and security uh, requirements as cloud exploded globally. Yeah, thank you very much for your service to our country. Uh, appreciate that. Your background is fascinating too, uh, being a pilot of many different planes. And as part of our kind of uh, pre-discussion when we were mm -hmm. we were um, consulting, getting some of your guidance, you went ahead and took a look at our last episode, episode number three, and pointed out some key important considerations from that that customers should take into account. The, the way you started off, I thought was great, which was you brought in your background <laughs> of flying multiple planes and then yeah. started right to allude that to being an administrator in multiple clouds. So maybe give us your perspective on how those two relate. Sure, um, absolutely. I mean, everyone knows what a, a pilot is and that's uh, somebody who flies your plane and you have gotten a certification, at least in the United States, from the Federal Aviation Administration. But what many people don't realize is that that's not enough to go flying. You have to get what's called a type certificate. So whatever aircraft you are flying, you have to get additional training on a specific aircraft. You know, what type of engines, um, what the hydraulic system may be like, what are the switches and what are the emergencies on that particular aircraft? Well, it's a lot like when you're in a multi-cloud environment. You may know all there is to know about cloud computing, but you need to get a type certificate on the specific cloud that you're operating in. You need, and that could be these clouds are completely different. So it's, it's really important, not just to know cloud, but to know the details of the specific cloud and how to monitor it, how to secure it, the good points of that cloud and the bad points of that cloud. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is, uh, I think this kind of brought you to your point number one, which was that multi-cloud changes everything. And in that regard, mm -hmm. you've got, we mentioned the idea of jumping from one cockpit to the to the next, and obviously that's not you know you fly a plane like you said for a while, which in many yeah. ways mimics administrators. Administrators have been flying on-prem infrastructure, right? If we kind of continue the analogy, and now yeah. they've got to fly these different cloud models. Uh, very challenging. The same way you said that certification needs to take place 
one of the one of the major things that I hear from customers all the time is finding the people that have those equivalent certifications is hard, right? They are in high demand and there aren't enough of them going around. But what are some other considerations for the multi-cloud changing everything for customers? Well, you know, when you're flying a physical aircraft, um, you only have to fly one plane at a time. Uh, but in a multi-cloud world, you're actually flying multiple clouds simultaneously, and they all have differences. For instance, how, uh, how is a service being charged in cloud A versus cloud B? Um, even for the same service, it could be being charged by quantity of, uh, of the service being consumed, how long or time you're consuming the service, how many users are consuming the service, or even how many connections are being made by your organization to that service. Now, if the CSP is charging all these different ways, you as the consumer have to track that all those different ways. That could really be confusing for your account accounting department. <laughs> yeah, I've heard directly from customers where they are transposing the information about mm -hmm. cost, right, into spreadsheets that then they report up. And by the time that gets aggregated, it's already uh, it's already dated. And someone's already spun up a whole bunch of new re of, of more resources. So certainly, I guess it's almost like I'll keep uh, torturing the analogy, right? It's having to watch, you know, <laughs> multiple fuel gauges, right? Although in this yeah. case, it just keeps ringing up. It keeps ringing up the uh, up the bells. Uh, right, and even if uh, it even goes down to the the type or model of cloud that you may be consuming, an organization could be consuming software as a service and infrastructure as a service as well as platform as a service from the same provider or from multiple providers. And things like the security controls that are being used. If you're consuming software as a service, it's actually up to the cloud service provider what controls to put in place and because they are actually managing those controls. But you as a consumer need to do your homework as to what controls are available in the standard service, because you may need additional controls based upon your industry or your country. Um, so you need to do make sure the right controls are in place. Similarly, if you are consuming infrastructure as a service, it's up to you to know what controls need to put in, be put in place. And it's up to your security team to monitor those controls. So um, that means doing a multiple cloud or multi-cloud security is a whole new thing. When you're running your own infrastructure, you make those decisions. When you're consuming cloud services, you need to know what's going on. When you're talking with your, your clients and uh, at industry events, um, is it surprising or do you, see, do you see folks who have managed traditional infrastructure, security, those, those different items that you just mentioned, that yeah. they know what to expect when they transition to the cloud or are they, where do they find themselves? Well, the, the worst term I think that's used, and it's used broadly, is cloud hosting. <laughs> because it, it sounds like a um, service provider, right? A, 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 a managed service provider. When you use a managed service provider and they may be hosting your server, you get to tell the MSP how big the server is, um, um, how much, storage is on the server, what the controls need to be on that server. Um, and you make all the decisions typically via a contract. You as the consumer even make the decisions with respect to the service level agreement. So when a organization decides to go to the cloud, they assume that they could 
tell the cloud service provider what they need, how to configure the servers, how much storage to have and, and so forth. And they believe that they can write in the RFP, this is the service level agreement that you need to provide to us. But it doesn't work like that in cloud. The cloud service provider has already determined before you became a customer, what configurations they're going to use, what service level agreements they're going to offer. And, it's, and that is what drives the price. If you want something different, it's going to cost more. So a lot of people hear about cloud sticker shock and it's because you think it's just like a managed service provider and you negotiate all these things um, ahead of, of time. There's no real negotiation with a cloud service provider. You, you do your research on the, on the service and you determine if what they are offering meets your needs and requirements. The other part that you you uh, recapped um, was around security, right? And actually how security, and you had an interesting take on endpoints, how we should view endpoints or what an endpoint should be maybe even defined as. So share yeah. a little bit about what, what your thinking is there on security in the multi-cloud environment. Well, when you, uh, if you like Google endpoints, you'll probably get some answer about how many devices you have in your organization, um, making sure that you can secure the endpoint devices. And they may even expand that by saying these devices could be a smartphone, it could be a car, a vehicle, it could be a sensor, or it could be an Alexa uh, <laughs> in this big internet of, uh, internet of things world. But to be honest, that's not the real point, real endpoint. The real endpoint is the API that those devices are using. And every device can use multiple APIs. Similarly, with a cloud service, you may be consuming a like service A from the cloud, but that service will also have multiple APIs and each of those APIs do different things. So the real endpoint is not the service and it's not the device. It's the APIs that are defining what you are consuming from the service. And it's the APIs within the application that you're using with that device. And in today's world, most applications are made up via microservices. So it's the APIs from the microservice, which is being assembled in real time to uh, deliver what the user expects. So the today's endpoint is really the API, which requires API management and security. So instead of managing each device, you have to manage each API. And there's millions and millions of APIs. So, uh, <laughs> very, right, yes. very, very challenging. But I think it's, it's an interesting point that you're making around thinking about how these different APIs, what traffic goes into them, what traffic goes out of them. And it's actually a perfect segue as we get into our next section, we're going to talk about looking at anomalous traffic. Because one thing mm -hmm. to say that API 1 should talk to, you know, point 0.1 or point 0.2, it's another thing to say that the traffic across that is actually uh, what should be allowed and not something anomalous. Uh, Kevin, right. thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, very much appreciate it. Uh, I know you've got a, a, a super busy schedule, so thanks for making time while you are halfway around the world. Uh, enjoy your, your trip there in the conference, and we look forward to uh, bringing you back you know, in a future episode. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and, and have a great show. All right. Okay, with that, we're gonna we're going to now move into to network security, right? So, 
Kevin talked a little bit about the API security, and we're going to go, up, or I should say, maybe down the stack a level, a few levels, uh, to start out with the network security. And to do that, bringing a subject matter expert, I want to welcome Chad Skipper to the show. Hey, Chad, welcome. Good afternoon, good morning, good day, wherever you are in the world. It's great to be here. Good to see you again, Alexander. Nice to yeah. Be Great yeah. to have you. It's all. It's always great. Before the show, we do. You know, we practice and we talk about um, uh, the different issues in 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 your case, your subject matter area, network. And I always learn so much. So then, I hope through this show we can share that with the customers. Real quick, do you want to give us a quick intro on your background? Yeah, absolutely. So <clears throat> I've been in the cybersecurity industry for about thirty years now. Um, started off in the Air Force, Air Force Information Warfare Center, as well as the Air Intelligence Agency. Uh, from there, I spent uh, many years at Cisco um, on the networking side uh, and then on the endpoint side at Dell and, and Silence. And recently, uh, about three years ago, uh, VMware acquired a company that I was at, LastLine, which was a network detection and response capabilities. And we've integrated that into NSX. And that's what we're here to talk about today. Awesome. Now, when we talked a little bit before the show, uh, the first step, I love the first step, right? The first step is just, as you described, turning on the lights. So what does turning on the lights mean in network security? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, look, we at VMware, we, we think, you know, if you can't see it, you can't protect it. So visibility is key. And you've got to turn on the lights into all of the details that is happening within your multi-cloud because we at VMware have a strategic advantage and we own the hypervisor, the VNIC. And so we have the ability to see not only ingress, egress traffic, but more importantly, we have available, uh, the, the ability to see 100% of all of that traffic that is traveling east-west within your multi-cloud, across your clusters. And so having that visibility now, we can see right every packet, every flow, every, every uh, user on the network, a, a, as well as every application. And that visibility there now turns on those lights and we can do a lot once we begin to see, imagine just opening up, you know, going into, you know, a room, turning on the lights and, oh, wow, I have noticed something that I've never noticed before. So that is paramount and in a way to first get the lights on, get visibility into everything within your multi-cloud. That's the first step, absolutely. Yeah, I think at the time when we were when we were chatting before, I was in New York, and so I was uh, torturing yet another analogy, which was going down to the basement, flipping on the lights, and then seeing a bunch of critters scurry yeah, everywhere, scurry. right? <laughs> Just scurry. So scurry, it's kind of yeah. like that. Yeah. All right, the network, right? Let's see what's going on inside that network. Uh, ooh, all right. So from from there, lights are on. Things are scurrying around. Um, we want to make sure, right, that things don't scurry into the wrong place. They stay in the basement or they stay in the corner or whatever. And network folks define the, I don't know if they define this as, but it's often referred to as limiting the blast radius. Right. So share with us a little bit about the methodology for that. <clears throat> so just imagine now that I have the lights on, um, we... Um, at VMware can can then apply many forms of machine learning on top of that traffic. And that traffic then becomes a, a better understanding of knowing where these protocols are communicating, who's communicating with who, um, what pro ports, what protocols, what applications, what are those flows? And so then we can apply our machine learning on top of it to recommend, hey, look, you know, these are the flows that we see consistent um, and we would highly suggest that you put in segmentation or micro segmentation around these flows in order to, if a threat actor does gain that initial access onto any one of those, call it VDIs, call it workloads, then we can reduce that blast radius of them being able to move laterally to those to, to, to other devices. As an example, if you're running a VDI infrastructure, those VDIs should always be segmented away from other VDIs. There's no reason for a VDI to talk to a VDI. A VDI might need to talk to a service and you can have segmentation and micro segmentation to make sure that that VDI can only talk to that service. But these are areas to rather help reduce 
that threat actor, if they do get that initial breach, that beachhead onto a workload because they've done some type of remote code execution uh, against a vulnerability, or they end up on a VDI system because a user clicked on something and wanted those free coupons and they ended up getting ransom that on, on that one device. So that's where the reducing that blast radius really comes into play um, in helping stop those threat actors from, from moving laterally within the organization. Yeah, the, the machine learning that goes into helping to find that micro segmentation, super valuable, right? To make sure that you, that uh, known traffic or good traffic is actually, um, you know, helping to write, or it's helping to write the rules for what should talk to what. Uh, I'll also mention, because I am seeing some comments in the, um, in the, in the uh, chat that it, that for folks, this is a live show. And if you have questions as we go through the different guest speakers, please post them in there. Chad's going to be back at the end, along with our next speaker to cover all of that different Q and a. Okay. So we've, we've defined the blast radius, right? Um, in case something does get in, it can't go and compromise other things. And those are what I would call kind of known things, right? And we were talking a little bit about there's visibility, but then there is observability, right? right? And then there's the next step, which is looking at anomalous behavior. Walk us through that. Visibility may be kind of covered, but what is yeah. observability and the difference? So, so here's the reality of where we are in, in the world, right? The reality is even though that we have visibility into all those flows and that we have segmented all those flows, threat actors are living within the noise of our networks. They know as soon as I land, they know where they are. They're doing discovery. They understand that, hey, look, I have certain ports and protocols that I can leverage once I'm on these devices. And so there are, there are ports and protocols that threat actors use that we have to have that stitches those segmentation, micro segmentations together. Those threat actors are living in the noise such as remote desktop protocol. Remote desktop protocol is used by network administrators all the time to remotely manage all of their systems. And threat actors are riding on the backbone just like network administrators. And that's how they're crossing segmentation, micro segmentation because RDP is open. Another one is SMB Samba service. Most all organizations have this and they're using that to, you know, as a service to move their documents, their data from device to device, from storage, downloads, those types of things. Well, threat actors are using that same ports and protocols to move their malware laterally across the organization, just like we do when we just say, here, move here, move here, move here, right? So that's what they're doing. They're also using DNS. They're using DNS to hide their command and control communications, both east, west, and north, south. Um, mm -hmm. And we have to use DNS, and they're obfuscating it, and they're using it as a way to exfiltrate data outside the organization. DNS is a great tunneling protocol for, for data exiting out the organization. And then finally... Um, threat actors are using tools just like um, network administrators living off the land is what we call it. Sometimes we call it live, living off the land binaries where they're using PowerShell. PowerShell is a great administrative tool. It really helps these ne uh, network administrators to manage their networks. Threat actors are using PowerShell just like network administrators and they're creating internal C2 network communications. That's command and control. So we have to be able to, once we get the visibility, once we get that segmentation, micro segmentation, we still have to inspect every single packet across the entire cluster. And doing that, we have taken the inspection technology down to the data itself because we own the hypervisor. So we have things like a network sandbox. That sandbox is going to be able to take those artifacts that threat actors are using like ransomware, like Trojans, those types of things. And we can inspect those at the VNIC and be able to determine before they even write the disk if this payload is indeed malicious. That's mm -hmm. one area. So now we're looking and inspecting those payloads. The second area is the intrusion detection intrusion prevention systems. We have taken that and we have integrated that into the VNIC. So all of that, now we can see, you know, not just north-south exploits, but what threat actors are doing is once they get in, they're looking for vulnerabilities east-west. And so I can take that code and I can get it inside and then I can exploit log4j, 
print nightmare or whatever mm -hmm. new vulnerability that you have, I can do that east west once I'm inside. So that's where that IDS comes into play. And more importantly, is where network traffic analysis comes into play. And Alexander, this is what you're talking about early is those anomalies mm -hmm. um, on how threat actors are using your ports and protocols. So an anomalous RDP session, you know, out of the thousands, 10,000s, whatever, hundreds of thousands of RDP sessions you have a day, there might be two or three that we need to detect that says, hey, look, this is not a network administrator. This is a threat actor. Right. And that is why we call this observability. We have to observe everything and apply many forms of machine learning on it so that we cannot just see an anomaly because an anomaly is just not necessarily security relevant. Relevant, It might just be an anomaly. So that's why we have to observe that to understand it so that we can say, yes, this anomaly is truly security relevant. And at the end of the day, look, threat actors, we know this, they are staying inside of our organization's for 277 days before they're even noticed. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I want to close with this, Alexander. That's why it's important for us, right, to get that visibility, right, inside of the organization because we either want to prevent or reduce the dwell time of those threat actors by providing the visibility, reducing the blast radius, and then inspecting everything for that malicious actor. Yeah, I think that's that's a, a perfect intro into the uh, the demonstration that we have because we're going to run through that modern attack framework, right? Yep. And then how how uh, network administrators, SOC operators can go ahead and define the different components, see the different components, as well as how they're traveling. And one thing that we should note about the upcoming demo, and, and I want to make sure you chime in too, is on purpose the demo is constructed to not reduce the blast radius, Correct. right? So we're able to watch how a malicious item could actually move through the network, both on the known side, right? So we're looking at, okay, on a known side, we know what the threat is, so it's been identified. But also the other part you talked about, which is so important, the unknown but anomalous behavior that has been learned that can then be identified. So uh, with that, any other uh, anything else to, to add That's before we start? Point. That's a good point. This is in a detection mode only, right? Because, you know, if we prevented, we wouldn't have a demo. So we want to give you the understanding of uh, of the visibility that we have. And this is a this is a a, 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 a limited attack play, given the time that we have. Um, we've got some more extensive attack plays and understanding. But yes, that's that's where we are. All right. Awesome. Let's go ahead and roll the demo. With NSX NDR, we can correlate individual events from the NSX Sandbox, a malware prevention solution, network traffic analysis, and intrusion detection and prevention solutions into a campaign which provides security operators the full story behind an intrusion and maps every event to the MITRE attack framework. The security campaigns view provides a high-level overview of correlated tactics and techniques we observed within the environment. In this campaign view, we see further evidence of four threats targeting two hosts. The attack stages align to the MITRE attack framework, and we see evidence of delivery of some malicious artifacts, communications via command and control, and lateral movement and exfiltration. Now let's have a look at the blueprint of the intrusion campaign, and let me rearrange this visualization a bit to match our network topology. Here we have our attacker on the outside, and here we have our VDI desktop and our DB server. So let me put it over here on the left. The first thing that we saw was the VDI desktop download a malicious file that was hosted by the attacker that was detected by our malware detection and prevention capabilities on the gateway and distributed firewall. Then our IDS at both the distributed and gateway firewall detected the dark side command and control session with the attacker. Our network traffic analysis then detected the network traffic anomaly in which the attacker used the Eternal Blue exploit, a vulnerability in SMB version 1 protocol that essentially allows threat actors to move ransomware laterally through the network like we see here. And then we see exfiltration. The timeline view here helps connect the dots along the MITRE attack framework. First, the NSX Sandbox detected a malicious file download from an external source via phishing, and it ended up being the dark side ransomware. The NSX Sandbox does have preventative measures here and can stop this from happening. Next, we see the establishment of command and control via the IDS, 
Again, preventative measures can stop this communication. Our network traffic analysis then detects anomalous lateral movement via Eternal Blue, where it laterally delivered the DarkSide ransomware to the database server. From there, DarkSide command and control communications were established, followed by exfiltration of data via an encrypted command and control channel over the DNS protocol, which is an effective tunnel out of most networks. This gives us a complete network overview of the campaign as we have correlated and connected the dots of the threat activities we observed through the network. All of this without the needing to deploy any sensors in the network, without needing any hairpinning, without spans or tap, and regardless of network connectivity. So with this, we have completed our analysis and learned that this was not just a case of ransomware being executed on a database server, but we've learned that the attackers gained initial access via VDI desktop, were able to move laterally due to lack of segmentation, and were able to ransom and exfiltrate data out of the database. Yeah, fantastic demo. A lot going on there, right? And um, I wanted to piece. I wanted to pull out one important, one important component, which is the differentiation between the known threat, which was identified, and so we can put up the uh, um, the screenshot there of the demo. So the known um, dark side versus the anomalous behavior that was identified, and then going in between um, different segments. So maybe talk a little bit, talk us through that. And Shannon, if you're there, if you can put that visual up, would be great. Yeah, so what we saw in this attack play is that initial access. That's the first thing that you're seeing there, and that's a sandbox. And those are preventative technologies there. We're detection mode only. So we saw it, we were able to analyze that and say, yeah, this is indeed the delivery mechanism of that payload, that .exe as an example, right, of that ransomware. Um, the second thing that happened in line was that IDS IPS. We have a signature on it, um, and that was enabled to the command and control. But more importantly now is that third is that yellow, right? That that e e eternal blue. That's where the anomaly detection comes into play. And as an example, we just chose eternal blue here. We've could have done, like I said earlier, remote desktop protocol. Or they could have done pass the hash over Kerberos, or they could have done some type of remote task scheduling uh, via PowerShell. Um, these are ways in which anomalous, uh, they use their activities, anomalous activity to move laterally within the organization. In this case, we chose Eternal Blue, but we have other demonstrations that uses pass the hash, that uses RDP, that uses these top supports and protocols to actually then move laterally. And that is our network traffic analysis capability that is understanding all of those flows east, west, and then applying multiple forms of machine learning on it to get to, hey, this RDP session does not look like a normal RDP session. Oh, look, they're using eternal blue to move uh, malware laterally. And this is anomalous activity inside the organization. And then finally, scrolling on further down, we end up seeing the end of it because this is what we're seeing happening. Threat actors are not ransoming first. They are not ransoming first. They are exfiltrating data prior to the ransom activity itself. So we see the exfiltration and then the ransom happens on the endpoint. And this is where we're talking about double and triple extortion that these threat actors are doing. Because they're both encrypting the data, if they are successful, right? And we'll get to that. And they're able to encrypt what's actually on, uh, what, what's the active data that's being used by the organization. So that's step number one, right? They're saying, okay, nope, now you can't use it anymore. Uh, then, oh, by the way, we also have a copy of it, which we're going to release if you don't pay a second, um, that's penalty, correct. second, that's correct. a second ransom. That's right. Uh, the, yeah, so, so FASA in terms of, of the visibility here that, 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 uh, is provided to the SOC operator. And I want to tie it back a little bit to the term that I always like, or the, the phrase that I always like, which is time to value. In this case, it's a different type of time to value because you're racing against the clock for exfiltration or for some type of a ransomware. So the ability to understand how quickly, right. To, to identify very quickly something that is known and even something that is unknown but anomalous is super valuable to the customer. What are some things that you are considerations you've seen from customers or challenges that they've had and, and where this has come in, come in handy? So um, it goes back, the, the consideration from customers, they always come back to me and they say, I just don't know. I just can't see. I don't have the visibility. 
Um, and and that is that that is a significant aspect of, of where we are in the multi-cloud world. Um, and, and so we have to see the connections and the conversations. Um, I, you know, the 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 C the C suite that I'm talking to are no longer about individual events. You see here, we have a lot of individual events, but it is the campaign. It is what is that threat actor doing inside of my aspect, inside of my environment at a totality, right? And so then how do I then begin to uh, take action upon that? There are many ways that you can take action here. You can segment, you can put it in prevention mode, right? These types of things. But the core funk, the core foundation aspect that I'm seeing from most C C level, um, as well as you know, uh, you know, the SOC administrator is, I just can't see it, and so that is that's where we come in because um, we have built this in. We're not bolting on. We have built it in. We're taking we're taking the uh, analysis directly to the data itself, right? So no more hairpinning, no more spanning, no more tapping. No more bolting on. This is all integrated, and this is the the the, the uh, advantage of of uh, the VMware architecture. Yeah, you know, one thing that really popped in my head as you were talking about this is the con that what you said when you said campaign, right, versus right. a threat and the CIOs. And so the if I kind of torture the analogy again, and I say, okay, well. The threat when we turn on the lights was the, you know, maybe a couple of, let's just say a couple of roaches that we saw, but it turns out there's thousands of roaches in the wall and they're on a campaign to take it, to take us over. So it's not onesie, twosie threats, right? These advanced threat actors turn it into a coordinated campaign to do all these different steps. And, and I'll close with this. Mm -hmm. It's an analogy. 277 days in your organization. Imagine somebody living in your house for nine months and you not knowing it. Going room to room, watching what you do, eat, sleep, you know, brush your teeth. And oh, by the way, they're using your communications just like you do. And pretty soon they're no longer six degrees away from the data in which they want. Right. And mm -hmm. so that's where we have to do it. We have to get that visibility. From there, we can segment, reduce the blast radius, and then inspect for those anomalous activities to either prevent or reduce that dwell time of those threat actors. Yeah. You know, I might leverage some of that framework you just talked about and apply it to my son who just came home from college as he lives here over the summer, you know, decrease the blast radius that yes. he can... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that he can uh, leave laundry around and whatnot. So, right, exactly. Chad, thank you very much. Uh, for those listening live, feel free to continue to ask questions in the comments. Chad's going to come back right after we uh, bring on the next guest. So thank you, Chad. We'll see you again in a little bit. Okay. Now, we've done all of that detection. We've done all of that micro segmentation. Uh, even with all that, right, the worst ha can happen and does happen realistically. And so that is when the entire operation is being held by, by a ransomware and there's a need now to recover. So I wanted to bring on Yumi as our subject matter expert to walk us through how do we handle this when now the worst has happened and we need to recover our environment. Before we get started though, you may, uh, would you share a quick introduction about yourself and, and your background? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me today. My name is Yumi Hong. I'm Director of Product Marketing at VMware covering our cloud data protection and storage products. Awesome. And before we uh, jump, before we get into the operationalization of recovering an environment, uh, we got to make sure we have an environment to, to recover too. So maybe talk to us about the preventative things that need to be in place even before getting to the next step. We kind of call it some good hygiene. Yeah, absolutely. And this is a really critical piece of the puzzle that's oftentimes overlooked. Um, and it's really important because in order to have a robust ransom protection plan, you need to be able to cover both the preventative phase as well as the recovery phase, right? Because the unfortunate reality today is that even if you have all the preventative measures in place, uh, the ransomware attack will get in. And in fact, 65% of the organizations who find themselves uh, with ransomware attacks, they find that their data has already been encrypted. So like, how do you prepare to recover from these scenarios, right? So uh, first of all, uh, very basic stuff. Uh, 
uh, you need to make sure that you have enough snapshots to work with. And so uh, you need to make sure that when you find yourself in that situation, the ransomware dwell time isn't longer than the snapshot history or um, that your backups have been deleted. So having a solution where you have um, enough snapshot history, as well as what we call immutable backups, where the malware can alter or delete your backups, um, is critical. But I say that that is table stakes because uh, today, as Chad was mentioning before, the ransomware attacks look very different because the has evolved. So uh, prior up until 2016, uh, most of the attacks were file-based where you know they would entice you to open certain types of files and if you opened it uh, that would be the way the bad actors would get in right and uh, so then you would know like the the signature and so you would match that against a database of well-known viruses and that's what traditional backups and traditional file scanning tools used to do right um, and so their recovering from that was pretty uh, easy because you would just match the virus against this well-known database. And if, if there was a match, then there was an infection. If there wasn't, then that was a clear, clean point that you could recover back to. But then starting in 2017, we started seeing modern ransomware emerge. And so these are all the things that Chad talk about, talked about in terms of anomalous behavior, of fileless attacks where um, the attacks are living in memory, um, they're going after things like PowerShell scripts, Windows registry, or in the case of the notorious Lock4J attack, Java libraries. And so you can scan all the files you want, but you're not going to find anything because these are not file based. And so uh, this is where traditional backups and traditional file scanning tools are bringing a knife to a gunfight, right? Because um, in order to detect these types of attacks, you have to run the workloads, you have to see how the workload behaves, and that's how you'll detect these types of modern ransomware. And in order to do all of this experimentation, you need to do that in an isolated recovery environment. This is a Gartner term, that sandboxed environment that's cut off from the, the external network. Um, and so you need that isolated recovery environment in place. You don't wanna be building that from scratch when the ransomware attack is occurring. And so that's why you need to have that um, a, a way to spend that up beforehand. And then also um, that behavioral analysis, next-gen antivirus, that all needs to be built into the ransomware recovery solution. So you talked about quite a few different pieces or components that customers have to think about. And maybe, and, and I think you touched on it a little bit, but it, it'd probably be worth making the point, the complexity of the environment that has to be recovered and the number of steps that have to be you know, considered at a time when there's probably immense pressure from management, from security ops, from compliance saying, we got to get the business running again. So how, you know, what are some of the, the key components to be able to do, deal with that situation? How do, how do customers kind of think about that? Right. So if you've set up your retention policy for your snapshots appropriately, then you'll potentially have thousands of snapshots that you're looking at, right? And so knowing where to start can be a very daunting task. Uh, and so helping with that identification process is one thing that we do, as you'll see in the demo later on. Um, and then we also spin up an on-demand, fully managed, isolated recovery environment where customers can do that staging and validation of the recovery points. And then we also automatically inject the antivirus, next gen antivirus and behavioral analysis to be able to properly validate those recovery points. Because as I mentioned before, most attacks these days, um, they're fileless. And so you need to be able to observe that workload using AIML in order to be able to detect these modern uh, forms of ransomware. So um, those are things that we've all built into the solution. Um, you need to be able to streamline and automate it. And so we have an end-to-end -end ransomware recovery workflow that guides you step-by-step -step through the entire process. And um, this is a team effort, right? Um, it's primarily led by the infrastructure team generally, but then the security team and everybody else in the organization needs to work together. And so that's where we have capabilities like badging and other um, things that help these teams collaborate with each other so that they can predictably home in on the best recovery point and then restore that back into the production environment.
Yeah. You know, that also served what your recap there as a perfect intro to the demo, I think, because we're going to walk through those. We're going to see it now, right? In, yeah. uh, in what would be probably, you know, I say is a very calm narrative tone, but I imagine that's not the, uh, the tone that most people would be using uh, when faced with a very challenging situation like recovery. So with that, let's go ahead and roll the demo. There are many products that can restore a virtual machine from backup. I'm going to show you features in VMware Ransomware Recovery that provide faster, more reliable ransomware recovery. You will see guided recovery workflows, an on-demand isolated recovery environment, badging to keep track of parallel work efforts, and modern malware analysis to help detect and recover from sophisticated ransomware attacks. Let's start with the guided recovery workflow. Building on VMware Cloud DR, we'll start with our ransomware-enabled recovery plan. These plans provide a guided workflow to orderly step through the ransomware recovery tasks from selecting backup recovery points through security analysis and validation to staging and recovery as shown here. We'll start the recovery workflow, select the desired application VM to process, and begin that process in the recovery site that we will now use as our isolated recovery environment, or IRE. This is an on-demand, cloud-based resource to safely conduct our recovery and analysis tasks, eliminating the need for you to manage dedicated resources in your current infrastructure. Another benefit is the assistance provided in picking the best recovery point to start this process with. With visibility into change rate and entropy data metrics on each snapshot, as well as user-applied badges to mark candidates already analyzed, there is less guesswork in the data points which help minimize recovery times. VMware Cloud DR makes testing easy, so we'll start the process with a known good, previously tested recovery point in our inventory. The VM is quickly recovered into the IRE and scanned with next-gen AV security sensors that will begin validation using a combination of behavioral analysis, malware scanning, and vulnerability analysis. This level of combined security analysis and validation on running workloads is critical for finding the latest, more sophisticated malware threats that cannot be discovered by file scanning alone. To help minimize data loss, you may need to try several alternate restore points to locate the most recent clean data point desired and need to be able to do this quickly. Along the way, we can annotate the work we are doing and badge the recovery point for others to see the status. The built-in guest file and folder restore capability allows us to extract data from other, more recent recovery points into the working version, further minimizing data loss. Working safely within the IRE, we can adjust the isolation level with push-button ease. We do not want to reinfect production or the current VM we are processing, and you can gradually increase the levels of network access a VM has while monitoring for suspicious behavior. This reduces the risk of reinfection throughout the recovery process. Once satisfied with the curation of the recovered VM, it's a simple process to stage it for eventual recovery. Saving any changes, patches, other data sets, or other remediations applied. We are now at the end of our guided workflow and ready to safely recover the repaired virtual machine back into the production site for operations replacing the impacted version discovered at the beginning of this demonstration. I love that last part, which is just so quick at the end where it's like, okay, we found the right one and then push button and then instantly, right? It goes back and replaces the bad one. Um, but all the steps getting to there are very, very challenging, right? When it comes to going from how do you find that recovery point? And so with that recovery point, we can go ahead and let's pull up the, uh, the visual for the recovery point. And did I lose Yumi? I may have lost Yumi. Um, but if you can still pull up the visual, I can talk about it a little bit. So uh, what's, what's really valuable about the tool is the ability to go through all of these different points Right, so you're looking at a timeline history. Hi, welcome back, Yumi. We were just, we were, I was just going through this visual and talking about how you can look at that history and then you can find the snapshot that you want. 
And one of the markers that helps you, right, the, uh, the graphs down there is entropy. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about how does entropy help us find the right spot to possibly recover? Right. So essentially what we're doing here, surfacing insights to help customers best identify recovery point candidates. So we're surfacing, surfacing these insights along the snapshot history timeline. There's data change rate and there's also file entropy. And these are pretty good indicators of whether an encryption event has occurred at that point in time or not, uh, because essentially entropy is referring to the uh, anomalies in the data, right? And so um, it, uh, if there's a spike in the entropy rate as well as the change rate, then that's a pretty good indicator that something happened at that point in time. And so then we allow customers to select the snapshot and then um, they can then start validating that recovery point using both the traditional file scanning um, as well as the next gener generation antivirus and behavioral analysis that can be performed to identify the, the fileless attacks. Yeah, it's super useful. So we look at that green check and we look at that red, you know, stop uh, or warning sign. And what we want to do is reduce the delta because the delta is time. We want to get as close to the point, right, of the infection without getting into it to restore. So we lose as little data as possible. Not simple to do, right? Imagine, I mean... Uh, <laughs> I've tried to do that on my own computer sometimes where I'm trying to figure out oh, what was the last point when I needed to recover something and to look at it, examine it, et cetera. Uh, very, very challenging. The absolutely. let's, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Did you have a comment about that? Oh, no, I said, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We're trying to minimize data loss, but also find a, a clean recovery point at the same time, which is challenging, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. So huge operational help to the the, per, the people that are recovering the environment. Let's go to the next one, the next slide. Yeah, because this one uh, is kind of a zoom in from the demo showing how you can go to different levels of network isolation. So talk us through, you know, why we'd go from one step to the next. Yeah, uh, so one of the beauties about this product is that we've integrated best-in-class capabilities for multiple products within VMware, right? And so here showing the integration with NSX, uh, which is our networking security product, as you know. Um, and so uh, this is where we help customers set the right VM isolation network levels because um, the nature of the ransomware attacks today is that they can remain dormant in the backups and then reactivate themselves at recovery and reinfect your production environment all over again. And so it's important to be able to have that isolated recovery environment and here, the benefit of our solution is that we have push button VM network isolation levels so that customers don't have to manually configure the firewall rules. And so we're micro segmenting the VMs into tiny isolated recovery environments. And then we can control the recovery process uh, by allowing customers to select from these pre configured uh, isolation levels. Yeah. The other major benefit, right, of this capability is to recover, right? It's, it's disaster recovery as a service. So the worst happens, right? And then by, you know, by using the, the automated workflow, have the ability to spin up that entire sandbox, analyze, et cetera, out in the cloud. So it's not an on-prem requirement, right? This is the real multi-cloud, being able to use the benefit of cloud capabilities of the hyperscalers in order to do that. Yep, absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much, Yumi. Uh, I know I've seen a lot of comments coming in, which is fantastic. Definitely welcome those comments because we're going to bring back our other guest speaker, uh, Chad. And then we're also going to welcome back Leanne, or actually welcome to the show, Leanne. Welcome back from episode one, two, and three, because Leanne is behind the scenes, uh, busily working away to manage the, uh, the Q&A and going to uh, bring some of those Q&A to the surface now. Yeah, absolutely. And there really have been some great comments. So I'm still looking at that. So please do keep the comments um, coming and questions and we'll get to as much of it as possible. Um, it has come up a couple of times. So just a reminder, as soon as this episode ends, the recording will immediately be available on LinkedIn. And then if you continue to follow our blog, we will also make sure that show notes and everything are, are updated out there. So thank you to for all the comments. If there's any parts of it that you've missed or you want to review, please come back and look at the recording. Um, so with that, there have, have been a lot of questions and it's not specific to ransomware, but uh, Chad, one thing that's that's come up 
a, a couple of times here in the comments is really understanding the inspection. So if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit more of, of from the NSX perspective, um, if you've got layer three or four inspection and that's happening, then what are the benefits or the reasons for actually doing security at the application level? So kind of waiting for that lateral movement to happen. Right. So absolutely. So layer three and four, we're talking about, <clears throat> you know, the, the network layer and the transport layer. Um, and, and from that perspective, we're going to have visibility into anomalous activity, such as at the network layer connections between suspicious ports. Right. Or beaconing outside of an organization or beaconing within the organization itself. But all, all the way to 11, uh, layer seven, you're looking at the application. Right. And, and so you need to be able to understand those applications such as exploits of applications. Right. Um, and, and you need to be able to understand that because we can move laterally um, in, inside of an organization by exploiting an application. So that's why we are layer three through layer seven, because threat actors are using layer three all the way through layer seven to move laterally within the organization. And that's why we need to inspect, but also observe and have a continuous baseline of everything east-west so that we can continuously understand the natural movements and evolution of the network, but also uh, what those threat actors are doing across, you know, layer three through seven. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. And I know that that's something we, we talk about a lot as far as managing at the different layers. So just kind of wanted to make sure that that was, that was really clear and, and how powerful NSX is. And I, I think that actually kind of leads into then, um, Yumi, a, a question for you as far as with ransomware recovery, how is that different from other backup and recovery products that are out there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're really excited about this solution because it's the industry's first purpose-built ransomware recovery as a service solution. And there are a number of key ways in which our product is different from anything else that's out there. First is that we're offering a fully managed isolated recovery environment, which is key to preventing reinfection of your production environment. And we've embedded next generation antivirus and behavioral analysis directly into the solution itself. And finally, we have this end-to-end -end ransomware recovery workflow that automates and streamlines the entire ransomware recovery operation. And so how are we able to do this? It's because we own a lot of the IPs that are involved in terms of what customers would need in terms of recovering from an, uh, a ransomware attack, including VCDR, which does the backup and the storage, provides that workflow, Carbon Black, which does the next-gen AV and behavioral analysis, NSX for the push button network isolation levels that I mentioned before, and then VMware Cloud on AWS as that fully managed on-demand isolated recovery environment. So we're in a very unique position to be able to offer this type of service. Yeah, I think that is, you know, a fantastic way of connecting the dots, right, in the multi-cloud world where VMware is bringing together the products, right, the sum of the parts, right, is, is, is a huge impact to solving customers' problem, to reducing the time to value to identify or that either that network threat or isolate it or in, implement the proper security and not have to be in multiple tools trying to correlate things. So I got a note from uh, that we are we are up on time. And so I think there is a, a lot of other questions. We'll have to uh, answer those separately because we've got folks uh, in the comment section so we can get back to them directly. With that, I do want to thank very much, Chad, as well as Yumi for our guests and for coming back and uh, bid you both farewell. Hope that we will see you on a future episode. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, wrap the episode. So to, reco to, to recap real quickly, the things that we covered today, number one, welcoming our guest speaker, Kevin Jackson, who gave us his perspective on how the multi-cloud changes everything, uh, as well as what considerations customers needed. Then we looked at turning on the lights to, to, to actually be able to see what's going on in the network traffic. And Chad did a great job of explaining, hey, you know, many times customers are just coming and saying, tell me what's going on, help me understand what's going on in my network traffic. From there, it was about you know did, um, creating that blast radius or, or limiting that blast radius through micro segmentation, and then understanding anomalous behavior. Super important with this next generation of threats and campaigns. Huge, you know, a, a huge thing to consider is a campaign against organizations to exfiltrate data to encrypt multiple different things going on. 
then if the worst happens, being able to recover from that ransomware uh, attack and Yumi helped walk us all the way through that. With that, I want to thank everybody for joining as well as thank our speakers and encourage you to join us for the next episode where we're going to talk about the challenges of mergers and acquisitions and how that applies to the multi-cloud. And you may ask yourself, well, how do those two things connect? Quite simply, when one company acquires or merges with another, then they're going to inherit, of course, their IT architecture, which many times or most of the time is going to be very different or, or you know, have multiple clouds. So how does one tackle that? How do you, again, getting the time to value to make sure that acquisition, that merger goes smoothly from an IT standpoint? So scan that code. Thank you again for joining us and look forward to seeing you on the next episode, number five of the Multi-Cloud Expedition. Have a great day. Thank you.